Well, good morning, church family, and welcome to another Church in the House. I hope that um, you've been able to uh, gather with a few people today, whether it's just your family or you've got some others around with you today and are able to do church together because um, the church is not a building. We are the church, and so we are having church in the house at the moment as we uh, try and avoid COVID as much as possible together. Um, I just want to say thank you to all of those of you who have prayed for my family over the last two weeks. Um, <clears throat> we are finally kind of getting on the mend now. Um, the kids are all better. Mike is much better. I seem to be the one <laughs> struggling to get over this COVID. And um, uh, so your continued prayers are much appreciated. Um, please also keep the other families and church in mind who are really struggling with COVID. Um, there are a few families that are really struggling with it and so please make sure we're praying for those people. Reach out to people who might need support, um, whether it's doing a grocery shop, making a meal. I know for us those were things that hugely just relieved the pressure of, of all that COVID had to offer us over the last couple of weeks. Um, so yeah, let's be, let's be uh, God's people to one another and look out for one another as best we can. Today we're going to be talking about um, a topic we don't often talk about in church. Um, we're talking about the topic of lament. And um, before I get into the message today, uh, Meg has something to share with our kids for our kid spot. So I'm going to hand over to her now. Hi everybody. Welcome today. It's nice to see you and be with you. Today, Melissa's talking about the art of lamenting when we get there. It's that the way that we despair or we talk to God um, when we have really big feelings. Now a lot of us have big feelings a lot of the time um, but I think with all the stuff going on in the world at the moment a lot of us might have even bigger feelings than usual and I think we can look to the way Jesus lived to think about how he responded to his big feelings. It wasn't that he didn't get angry, it wasn't that he didn't get sad, we see clear verses in the Bible where Jesus wept when his friend Lazarus died. He was so sad. We see verses in the Bible where Jesus was betrayed by his friends and felt so disappointed with them. We see, and in those cases, he went straight to God and prayed in quiet places. We see places where he was exhausted. We see times he was furious. Um, and he responded to all of those times. I wonder what big feelings you've been dealing with this week. And I want to give you a quick chance. This is for all ages to tell God about them. Just chat to him quietly in your head. So I'll give you a prompt and then I'll give you 10 seconds to be telling God about it. So tell God quietly in your head about the best thing that happened to you this week. Now I want you to tell God about something that made you feel uncomfortable this week. Now I want you to just chat to God and tell him about something that made you feel really sad this week. If you wanted to take it further other times, you can leave those bits for longer. You can create different prompts yourself. You can ask God to tell you what you might want what he might want you to do about those feelings you might need longer than 10 seconds to hear from him but you might hear from him in 10 seconds so I wonder if you'd like to give that a go through the week for now I'd like to read you a story called Aroha's Way it's a lovely New Zealand book about a, um, a kid who has big feelings and it gives some really good suggestions about what you can do in the moment when you have those big feelings. I know a child called Aroha, warm of heart, broad of smile, 
stalk of hair, wild as wind from the great southern isle. She runs through the long grass, skips in the leaves that waltz with the wind through the bare autumn trees. She'll sing and she'll dance and she'll hug and she'll play, for that is Aroha's way. But now, now and then, Aroha feels troubled, all alone, small and meek. Sometimes frozen with fear, sometimes too frightened to speak. And her belly tumbles with butterfly wings. Or she's held fast where she stands by invisible strings. I wonder if you've ever felt like that. Or if a, that nasty little voice whispers, Aroha's no good. Or another voice says, oh, she shouldn't, or oh, she should. It's okay, Aroha knows what to do. I wonder if you know what to do when you feel like that. Well, Aroha runs and jumps. She tumbles and spins. She does exercise till those butterflies quiet their fluttery wings. And then she'll breathe deep down as deep as she can. And she'll blow away those strings holding her fast where she stands. Ah, oh, the power of big, deep breath. And when that voice comes whispering, Aroha's no good. She'll feel the cold air crisp leaves underfoot, the sound of birdsong, the wind through the woods. She'll just take a moment to concentrate on what's around her and feel things. She'll listen, she'll feel, she'll close her eyes and she'll give a smile and the voice will grow quiet for a while. If that voice says she shouldn't or she should when she's stuck at the fork in the road through the woods, she'll share her troubles, she'll talk, and she'll find her way home. For Aroha is never alone. I always find it amazing that the best psychological advice for mindfulness and for um, dealing with our emotions is often the stuff that we find in the Bible. Um, we hear about David's, when we read about it even last week, about David celebrating the idea that God leads him through quiet waters and calms his soul. God, we, we thank God for the way he can calm us. We thank God for the breath of life that he is and he gives to us. And for the, our physical bodies so we can dance and sing and move about and use our whole bodies to worship him as we spoke about last week. So these are things we can do with our minds, things with our bodies, things with our breath and things with the people around us. So when the feelings get really big, take them to God. Exercise. Be aware of your surroundings. Take some deep breaths and talk to someone. So I'll see you next week and God bless you. So thanks very much, Meg, for that message for our, our kids. And kids, I hope you got heaps out of that today. So church, like I said, today I want to talk to you about the topic of lament. Um, it's not something that we talk about very often in churches. In fact, I don't think other than me, you know, doing this topic myself, I've never really heard us talk about lament in church before. And I think that to deny for some of us that these are really troubling times is to put aside the hurt and anger and worry that so many of us are feeling right now. And that's just not right. Um, it's not just the threat of a virus. But for many, there are financial strains and burdens that this, the whole thing has brought upon you. We have seen an increase in depression and anxiety in our country. And I'm sure like myself, many of you have had your hearts broken for Ukraine and Tonga and Afghanistan. As a mother with young children, they are my first thoughts. My thoughts always go to the, these children who are trapped in these horrible situations. And it just breaks me all over again. I can't watch the news at the moment without just breaking into tears as we watch these families and these children suffer from all the things that are going on around our world. It's easy to look at the state of our country, the state of our world, maybe even the state of our own hearts, um, and the anguish, pain, and heartache can feel really overwhelming. What I would hate 
is for you to feel that God is not sitting with you in the midst of this anguish. You know, sometimes in church we think that we only show God's glory in the praise and the happy days. It's a thing we talk about a lot in church. And as someone who has experienced really dark days, I know that this can make us question our relationship with God. We do a huge disservice to our faith when we act like life is all cupcakes and rainbows as a Christian. We need to be real people. That's something I am super passionate about in the church is that we are a church of real people with real issues and real problems and that we have real lives and that we can acknowledge that some of those parts of life are super, super difficult. So for those of you who are living in some dark valleys and for all of us that will eventually walk through them, then this message is for you. God wants you to know that life will not always be perfect, the side of heaven. But that doesn't mean he doesn't love us and that he isn't with us. He has given us this gift, this gift of lament. Being able to bring our pain and our burdens before him so that he can listen and walk with us. Now the Psalms are some of the most creative and beautiful pieces of scripture. But they also have much to teach us about life and how best to live it. And today, we're going to be learning the art of lament from Psalm 142. So if you've got your Bible with you, um, you can always kind of guarantee if you go more or less to the middle of your Bible that you'll hit the Psalms. And we're going to be reading Psalm 142 together. So hopefully I've given you enough time to find it. If not, feel free to hit the pause button. But let's read Psalm 142 together now. This is a psalm of David regarding his experience in the cave, a prayer. I cry out to the Lord. I plead for the Lord's mercy. I pour out my complaints before him. I tell him all my troubles. When I am overwhelmed, you alone know the way I should turn. Wherever I go, my enemies set traps for me. I look for someone to come And help me, but no one gives me a passing thought. No one will help me. No one cares a bit what happens to me. Then I pray to you, O Lord. I say you are my place of refuge. You are all I really want in life. Hear my cry, for I am very low. Rescue me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison so that I can thank you. Then the godly crowd will crowd around me, for you are good to me. Hey church, let's pray together. Lord, we just want to thank you so much for this gift of lament, that we can express our pain and our anguish to you, and you listen. And Lord, as um, we share about it today, about what a biblical understanding of lament looks like, God, I pray it will be something that is instilled in our character, instilled in what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Help us to lament well for our world right now, God. Help us to be your hands and feet in the world right now. I just lift up this time to you, Jesus. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Now, I'm really encouraged to discover how much lament is displayed in the Bible. I mean, we have a whole book named after it, but I am especially encouraged and uplifted to see how much pain and anguish, frustration, depression, wrath, and heartache (laughs) is lamented in the Psalms. It makes God's word that much more real in a world filled with heartache. I think the real issue when it comes to God's people is we haven't really learnt how to lament. That may sound kind of depressing, but in times of deep anguish and heartache and loneliness, we can be at a loss on how to approach this with God. This psalm is written as an instructional how-to on lamenting. Spurgeon writes on Psalm 142, it teaches us principally, by example, how to order our prayers in times of distress. Such instruction is among the most needful, practical, and effectual parts of our spiritual education. And quite honestly, 
I agree. We have been learning many practical parts of the Christian faith, like prayer, communion, and reading the Bible. But I really feel teaching people how to lament to God in our darkest times is a skill that we have missed off the list for far too long. So it is time for us to learn the skill, teach it to others, and I believe we will come out closer to God for it. An Old Testament scholar by the name of Derek Kidner gives us this really helpful and of course riddled with alliteration outline that we will use to educate ourselves on the lamenting technique using Psalm 142 as our guideline. So here are the four parts that he gives us that we are going to be looking at in terms of lament. My plea, my plight, my portion, and my prospect. So we're going to start with my plea. When I worked for the Northern Baptist Association, um, I ran camps and conferences for young adults. Um, we asked our young adults some issues they would like to see or love to see their churches and the Baptist Union address. Uh, we even had um, the, the president or whatever Charles Hewlett's <laughs> title is for the Baptist Union come along to hear these thoughts of what these young people had to say. And mental health came up again and again, depression, anxiety, how to be balanced, how to be mentally well. The pressure to be mentally, physically, spiritually balanced, have an active life full of adventure, doing what you love, being anything you want to be, owning your own home, being your own person, finding what makes you happy. They all sound so good when you put them in a fancy quote with a pretty backdrop. But the more I ponder this to-do list, I find it less liberating and more exhausting. And I just cannot be the only one who feels that way. I think we all think that mental and health is a relatively new concept and it's at an all-time high, which it is. But then I read the Psalms and I think, yeah, maybe not so much. <laughs> we meet David in a cave praying this prayer. And what we can understand is that the cave for David is a really lonely place. He expresses in verse 3, my spirit grows faint within me. This depicts total exhaustion, a spiritual depression. I'm not sure if you've ever experienced depression before. <laughs> it's not fun, so I hope you haven't. But it's very numbing. Your brain feels like it's in this fog. Overwhelming seems a very underwhelming word to describe how impossible resolution feels and how hopeless that can make you. And it's in this state that we meet David, in a dark, damp, cold, quiet, isolated cave. When Mike and I went to Waiheke <clears throat> for a wedding, uh, we decided to tour the underground tunnels built by the armed forces to use there. And we were thoroughly unprepared for this particular trip. First of all, we were wearing jandals. We didn't bring a torch um, or cash to hire one because they didn't have FPOS. Um, it was dark. The steps and walls were wet. And down these very long staircases, there were absolutely no handrails. And as we were walking around <clears throat> in this cold, dark, damp place, the thought of knowing a of no one being able to rescue us if something happened to us bloomed into my whole being and I experienced my very first panic attack down in these on force uh, underground tunnels. Mike literally had to push me to the nearest exit. I can imagine that all of David's worries and troubles echoed around the cavern walls and it is here that he teaches us the very first step in lament. He audibly cries out to God, the plea. He lifts his voice in supplication to God. I don't know about you, but I'm so quick to let out my frustrations and my anger uh, verbally to my husband or my children or my dog <laughs> or my friends. And yet I am so slow to audibly express my pain, my deepest pain toward God. This is a skill and a habit that we desperately need to learn. The art of coming to God first when we are experiencing pain and anguish. David comes before his God and is feeling so lost and alone. He pours out all that exhaustion and depression before him. 
He lets his voice echo, his tears flow and drop to the damp floor. There is something in lamenting our deepest anguish to God that changes not God's heart, but our own. It reorients us to be face to face with who God is and who he is in light of our plea. The word supplication to the Lord in the Hebrew is translated to mean literally to his face. Be encouraged to verbally, audibly, in the secret place, pour out your pleas before God's face. We are called to rely on one another, absolutely, but this should not take the place of God. For in those moments, we understand more of who we are and who God is. So that's the first one, my plea. The second one is my plight. David expresses in verses 3 and 4 his plight, his problems, his predicaments. He is being chased and pursued by Saul's army. A snare has been hidden for him. And in amongst this, he is now the leader of 400 men, all fleeing uh, because they were either in trouble, in debt, or they were discontented with Saul. Not a crew that, you know, he was necessarily expecting to lead. <laughs> and yet he was a leader in a cave, in the depths of despair, feeling so very alone. In verse 4, he says, There was no one at my right hand. This was the place of a witness or legal counsel that would stand with him in a trial. And in his darkest hour, he felt like he had nobody beside him. In a cave, feeling like no one understands him, feeling alone and leading those he had no emotional strength to lead. I wonder if you've ever felt like David. What does your cave look like? Could it be loneliness like David? Maybe it's guilt of sin. Maybe it's heartache or fear of the unknown. We don't have to have David's exact experience to know what that cave feels like. I love this quote from Spurgeon, and it's one that's really worth remembering, so turn those ears on. It says that caves make good closets for prayer. Their gloom and solitude are helpful to the exercise of devotion. And as people who know our fair share of lockdowns, <laughs> my prayer is that your cave moves you to devotion in God. This is the second step in our lament technique. Recognize that the cave is a call to prayer. That just because you are in a cave does not mean that God has abandoned you or has left you to the wolves. This is an opportunity to exercise your devotion to your king. I think we are in a time where God is calling his people to see the caves of our world. That we would open our eyes to the big caves that are we are all encompassed in. I wonder if we have become too comfortable in what church looks like. And God is using this as an opportunity to shake us up and call us back to a heart of worship and a heart desperate to see what God is moving our world into. I really believe that. It should be making us drop to our knees, church, and seeking this devotion to God. Let the gloom and solitude of this cave drive us to prayer. We now move to part three, which is my portion. This is when David shifts his focus of his lament uh, from himself now to God. In verse five, he cries out, I cry to you, Lord, I say, you are my refuge. After identifying in verse four that he has no refuge, in his dingy dungeon of a cave, David declares that the Lord is his refuge, his hiding place, his security. He goes even further to say, you are my portion. The Hebrew translation of this is uh, allotment or inheritance or part. David is declaring here in this dark hour that God is his inheritance. Even though I've um, only been a short time here, <laughs> and you probably only heard me share a few times, um, you will know that I have mentioned it because it's a big part of my life and my story that Mike and I went through five and a half years 
of infertility treatments and IVF and lots of surgeries and operations and needles to have our little girls, Violet and Lily. It was absolutely grueling and it was by far the darkest cave that I have ever sat in. When we decided to have our second baby, uh, we started with our remaining embryos. Um, starting this process again of implanting embryos um, brought back all this anxiety around the uncertainty of not wanting to get our hopes too high. It was just emotionally grueling and I hate that. I hated that experience. So as part of um, getting ready to do embryo transfers, there are these tests that I need to do in preparation. So I went to my local GP for a test uh, with the nurse and I got Layla. Layla is a nurse that Mike and I got to know very well when Mike had a really bad cut on his leg that got infected. Um, he had to go regularly to get his dressings changed and Violet and I would go along most of the time and most of the time we would get Layla. She is this beautiful Pacific Island lady that is forever wearing a smile on her face and she is just so unashamed in her love for Jesus. And on that Tuesday, on a particularly low day as I was processing my grief of um, having to go through this process again to try and have another baby, <clears throat> when I had to go see the nurse, God blessed me with having Layla. Oh, she made me laugh and relax and then the tears just flowed. I told her of my fears and then she prayed with me and her prayer was just bursting with the promises of God, of who he is and who his love for his people that he has. That no matter the outcome, baby or no baby, he has laid the path and he walks it with us. Through Layla, God spoke his promises again over my problems, his love over my lethargic heart. Our third step in lament must lead to us acknowledging that God is our portion. He is our inheritance, that he will lead us and he will walk the path with us through every dark valley, through every green pasture. And there, there lies within it the power. When we share our story and our testimony of our darkest experiences while we are in the midst of it, and yet we hope in the Lord, there is power in that. When people see that even in the midst of despair, we cling to Jesus, they see that Jesus is worth clinging to. I'm going to say that again. When people see that even in the midst of our despair, that we are clinging to Jesus, they understand and they can see that Jesus is worth clinging to. I love hearing people's testimonies in church. Something we're going to make sure we incorporate a lot more when we go back into um, in the building services. But we need to make sure that we are sharing the testimonies that are also in the midst of the pain, sitting in the cave, where we can still say that God is good. There is power in that. That my circumstances do not define God's character or his promises or his love for me. Why are these stories important? Because there is hope buried in the very fabric of that story. And while hope is great to see when the story has worked out well and the outcome is all that we hope for, faith is real and alive when we can proclaim the glory of God even in the cave. We loosen the power of the enemy, of the circumstances, of the depression that seeks to strangle us when we speak God's promise, love and portion into our lives. When we do this, church, it leads to our final step in lament. And that is number four, our prospect, my prospect. David says in verse seven that freedom from his plight will give him the ability to praise God for what he has done and will lead the righteous to gathering around him because of God's goodness to him. Stephen J. Cole in his study on Psalm 142 notes David's focus is not freedom so that he can be happy again. This is the wrong motive for prayer. Rather, that David wants to be able to praise God. He says, this is what he says, David wants to extol God's power 
and faithfulness and mercy in the company of saints. In other words, he wants God to answer his prayer so that he can glorify God. Our final step in lament is the prospect of what we walk through is going to glorify God. In the midst of pain and anger, this can seem like a bit weird and maybe a bit unsatisfying as a final step. And look, I can only speak from a place of seeing this happen with a happy outcome. I see it in my daughters, Violet and Lily. Every time I look at them, I see God's glory. Because they're more than just an answer to prayer of my own happiness. There's so much more than that. You know, people walked with us. They watched us walk a very tough road, relying on God's promises of faithfulness to see his promise of a child fulfilled, children fulfilled. And he is glorified in all that he did. But how does this look when the outcome isn't as joyful or happy as we had hoped? Perhaps focusing on the outcome instead of God is the problem. See, it's the walk. It's the journey, the path laid before us all. That in dark valleys and in green pastures and uncertainty and heartache, we still seek to bring God glory. And that, that is where the righteous gather. We gather to lift up Ukraine and Tonga. That we lift up Afghanistan and our own nation. We gather to lament the pains in our own country, in our families, in our own lives. If we are seeking to bring God glory of loving him and loving others, this is where the righteous gather. So that in every season of life, God's glory shows for all to see. Church, we must learn the art of lament. We must teach others how to lament. This is how we remain healthy in our relationship with God and how we learn in an always and in all things to bring glory to God. It speaks to this world more than just pretending that we're all okay and that strapping on a brave face for Sunday is what we need to do. And church, I don't know where you sit today, happily in the sunshine or alone in the cave, but wherever we are, we are all welcome at the table and that Jesus sits with us and he walks with us and he hears us when we lift up our lament to him. So church, my prayer is that as we pray for our world, as we pray for the innocent who, who get caught up in this desire to seek power or in the in the floods and the earthquakes and all the things that just naturally happen in our world. As we seek to pray and our hearts are broken for, for those around the world and in our country and in our families, when our hearts break for ourselves and the, the pain and anguish that we're going through, that we will look at Psalm 142 and look at these four steps to lament and know that God hears us and that he is with us and that despite the circumstance we can still bring God glory that people will be found in Jesus they will look for Jesus and search for him when they see that we know that he is worth clinging to even in the darkest times of our lives so church I want to spend some time now praying over our world and praying for Ukraine. And I'm sorry I get emotional every time, um, but I, I, my heart is broken for these people. My heart it breaks for, for Afghanistan and the, the, the things that go on there, the stories that come out of there. My heart breaks for Tonga and the, and the floods that they've had and for our own people in a country that seems to be so divided my heart breaks. So will you pray with me now? Let us lament to our God. Let us spend some time lamenting our hearts to him. And let us bring glory to his name because there is power in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's pray.
Lord, we look at our world. We look at what's happening around the world. When we go onto um, news websites or we turn on the news at six o'clock, God, our, our hearts just break to see what people are going through. Children dying, Lord, so unnecessarily. People being killed for power and money and greed. People's homes and lives being devastated, God. And it is easy to feel so helpless in the midst of all that we see going on, Lord. And our hearts break. Our hearts break for our world. Our hearts break for the teenagers who are in such bad depression and anxiety that they take their lives, Lord. Our hearts break for the children who die on operating tables because they are victims of war. And it is easy to feel overwhelmed by it all, God. But we know that you are the God of the impossible. We know that you are the God of love and peace and grace. And Lord, we are praying desperately for our world. We are listening, God. We are listening. And we see the hurt and the anguish, God. And we ask for your kingdom come and your will be done. We pray, God, for, for healing of, of people's lives. We pray that the godly would rise up and open up their homes, open up their lives, Lord. Would you teach us, Lord, to be a people whose hearts break? May you bring us to our knees, God, that we can't do anything else but pray to you and say your will be done. May your glory shine forth in these situations, Lord. We pray for Ukraine, Lord, and, it, and the tragedies that are happening there every minute of every day right now. And Lord, while I don't know what is the, the right things to pray or the right things to happen, God, I just pray that you would be glorified in this situation and that you would save these poor, innocent people's lives. We pray for the countries around the world who have been devastated by flooding and other natural disasters that happen, God. And pray that the godly would surround those people and be your hands and feet and help them as much as they can. Challenge us, I pray, God. Challenge our very being to be a people that will not just stand by and watch these things happen, but that we would be a people that spend time on our knees praying to you, God, for your will to be done, for your glory to be brought forth in these situations, and that we would be your hands and your feet to feed the hungry to give water to the thirsty, to clothe the naked. God, challenge us to be a people that visit people in prison, to provide shelter for those who have none. And while it can feel all a bit very distant and far from us here in our little neck of the woods in our little corner of the earth, may we never just settle and be okay with the status quo of what's happening in our world. God, if we are not a people that are changed, let it not be wasted. Let it not be wasted. We pray these things in your name, Jesus, for you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You did the impossible. You brought us salvation through your love and through your cross and your resurrection. You have blessed us with the Holy Spirit. And we will never, never forsake that, Lord, and we will never forget that. So your name is mighty that we can say these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, church, I don't want to try and end this on a happy note. Um, <laughs> because I want to be real. And I really hope that um, this is a challenging message for all of us 
to be honest and be real about where we're at with our faith. Be honest and real with the things that challenge us in this world. And that we can learn to lament well to God. And that it changes us. And it changes our view of how we can impact this world. So I'm going to leave it there. I really hope that you have an impactful week. And that God challenges you to see how you can be an agent of change in this world. Have a great one. See ya.